As uh, Eric said, I've been an avid runner for uh, 56 years. Uh, and I'm older than that. I've just been running competitively lo that long. And I've uh, been an athletic trainer for 45 years. And most of those years, I took care of track and um, went through all these things that they're teaching us about diagnosis and you know, uh, return to play. But as we all know, the best predictor of a stress fracture or stress uh, injury is that you've had one previously because those people keep repeating. And so with my um, current job uh, working with the, the uh, SEALs that, uh, let's see if I can get this going. Oh, I forgot to say I don't have any disclosures. Nobody paying me any big bucks to do this or uh, anything. So um, I found that the guys that I work with are a different population. Uh, they're certainly different than a lot of your patients. Most of them, uh, all the officer candidates are college grads and 60% of the enlisted guys are college grads. And almost all of them have been athletes. And um, yet we still get a lot of stress fractures. And um, I felt that I had to do something to be able to uh, stop them from getting another one because with our guys, if they get a second, uh, they're gone, they're done. Uh, they out to the Navy, to the fleet. And they also have to be fast enough to pass tests each week. So it was my job as the athletic trainer to A, not let them get injured again, and B, to um, try to make sure that they go, go fast. So if you look at some of the things I hope that we'll be able to point out that we're going to try to do, and the questions I ask is, is it desirable to change their running style? Is it possible? that if we change their running style uh, that we can lessen the injuries, make them more efficient. Um, and what are those outcomes? And what, you know, what are the outcomes that we, I've shown that we're able to do with those? As I said, it's a unique population. Uh, the, not only are they unique, but as it says there, their running attire is not the greatest. Uh, they wear the outfits that you saw in the last two things, boots, pants. Uh, they run on the beach, and we can't change any of those things. Uh, we'll start with a, well, depends, on, uh, and I've been there for seven years. We've had classes as big as 240 to start with, and now it's about 150 people with, and usually only 25 to 45 people finish. So they don't spend a lot of time doing orthotics because they lose a lot of people and they spend a lot of money on orthotics for guys who might quit the next day. Uh, so we can't change that. We certainly can't change the boots. And what the SEAL instructors want to see, anyhow, their whole idea is to say, I'm going to put you through as much pain as possible and try to decide whether you want to play or not. So they're not looking to do anything that's going to make it easy for them. So with the injuries that we've seen in the physical therapy, and I have uh, the uh, pleasure of working with three physical therapists with us. One is in the military and two civilian. 60% uh, of our injuries are stress fractures, or stress injuries, stress changes. And um, I started looking at that and seeing, you know, we had all these parameters, but, you know, what, what can be the cause? And one of the things that, uh, you know, never thought in track, we knew that, hey, the cause was they're running. But with these guys, because they're from such a varied background, uh, I looked into them. We have a history of uh, each patient that 71% of the guys who were getting stress fractures with us were from a non-running sport background. By non-running, I mean they were swimmers. And I have a guy who's from the 2012 Olympic team as a swimmer who's six foot seven and has bilateral stress fractures of the tibias. Uh, water polo players, ice hockey players, wrestlers, uh, martial arts. And uh, I also consider baseball not a running sport. You know, it's like you make it to second base, you're exhausted. That's not a running sport. Um, and we've always looked at, at all the things they said, bone density, vitamin D, and all these things. And uh, we try to change it and stuff. But what can we do as athletic trainers, as physical therapists, to try to, to help them? And is there something we can do? So um, at the time I'm contemplating all of this, and you know, here I'd been an athletic trainer at that time for 42, 43 years and never really thought about it much or thought I could do something, I started thinking, well, geez, looking at these guys running on a treadmill, you kind of went, oh my God, no wonder you have a problem. You have an ice hockey player that looks like he's still on the ice as he's running. You say, 
that's not a real efficient technique. Maybe I should do something to change it. Well, what is a good technique? And if you've ever worked with track coaches, with distance runners, they kind of say, hey, that's the way they run, you know? We'll work on how far they run and how fast they run in intervals, but they never, oh, don't change how they run. That's, that's how they do it. So at that time, Alberto Salazar came through our area with um, the Oregon Project runners that he has. I don't know if you were aware of them at all, but Mo Farah, uh, Galen Rupp, uh, Jordan Hasse, who are uh, Matt Senschwitz, they're all coming to do mental training with our guys. And I started talking with Alberto um, about technique, and he said, well, I coach technique. And it's like, wow, that's, that's good. I've never heard a distance coach talk about that. So uh, he invited me up to, to watch those guys train, and so uh, that was my first thought, is I might learn uh, what to do and figure out what efficiency is. We've all been able to get the limp out of somebody, but do we know they're running most efficiently? I also started doing some online courses. There's a, a great online course, and I have my disclosure, I have no connection with this, but MedBridge, I took uh, some courses with Jay Dicieri, uh, and um, great an analysis of uh, treadmill uh, running, and uh, also started looking at research because I knew if I was going to present anything, it had to be basically evidence-based, and started going through that, and um, then started applying to the techniques to my guys. So I went up to Oregon, and this is what I saw. Um, this is their track. They obviously are not big on field events. Uh, you'll see in the middle there uh, a lot of trees growing. So um, I thought I would just sit back and watch Alberto coach. But um, Alberto had me, when I first got there, sit down in front of the computer and watch high-speed films of, of everybody running through, footplate films of everybody running through. We then went to uh, the treadmill and watched uh, Galen Rupp run on the treadmill. And if you know, Galen Rupp was the, uh, uh, the uh, bronze medal winner, winner in the uh, last uh, Olympics and got the second place in Boston Marathon. And those were his second and third times he ever ran the marathon. Uh, ran a 208 on the first time he ever ran. So it's like, hmm, he must be doing something right here. So more than just um, uh, watching him coach, they actually went through and, and spent the time to show me some things. And so I started learning about, you know, what are some of those things and started looking at the research about gait retraining. Is it possible to train some people, uh, is, it any, is it effective at all? And you'll see a bunch of references that I was surprised. There were many research things out there that it, it is possible. It's feasible to improve the running economy uh, and that gait modification uh, does actually help manage some of the bone stress injuries. And again, I probably went through over 200 research articles and narrowed it down to about 47 for this talk of, um, of things that actually go out there and, and tell us what you can do. So this is all great, and you know, what, what are we going to do with it? How am I going to figure this out? And so it was one of those aha moments. I woke up one night uh, in bed, and I was trying to figure out what... I could do to make it easier for the athlete to remember what the techniques were when I figured out what the techniques were. And so I had to come up with a mnemonic and I came up with the word faster. And it really, not so much for our benefit to say, oh, I need to make them faster, but it was something easier for them to remember. And also, they all want to be faster and your athletes all want to be faster. They don't want to do something that just makes them so they're injury free. They want to make sure that they are running faster. So. The words each mean something. The really order of it is no important thing. It was just easier to come up with a word and a word that they do. So each letter stands for something. Real easy game for us old people to remember things. Um, so the first thing is forward lean. And as it says, and, and uh, it's only 5 to 7%, which is very, very little. And it's also... Um, in a good posture, and that's the most important part is you have a very good posture when you do it, and that you don't do it bending from the waist. And the best way to describe it, and it's easy for me with my guys to do it, is to say, I want you to stand at attention. Well, that's you know, easy for my guys, but they're standing at attention, and one of the things is you want to tighten your butt, and you want to be good and straight like this, and then you start your lean forward, like you're going to do the giant ski jump, but just enough that you start to feel the weight go onto your midfoot and toes, and that's all it is. So you'll see that it's just a very small amount. Now, looking at research, they thought, well, you know, this is because gravity's helped pull you forward. Well, gravity does one thing. It pulls you down. So it's not gravity, but what we found is that in some of the research 
talks about the better posture lets you keep aligned and use your glutes more, which should be the driving force in your run. Your glutes are the most important part. Most people are more quad dominated. And so if you bend at the waist, next thing you know, you're not using them at all. So this is why it's important to do it. You'll, we'll see in a little bit about uh, some of the stride things will do it. The next A is arms. Never consider it all. And Alberto pointed it out to me. But if you work with sprinters, you will see that the sprinters are using their arms all the way up to the eyes. It's nice form and everything goes. With distance runners, there's nothing anybody does normally. And I'd say now from doing this all oh, about three years, 90% of the people either don't use their arms at all or use them wrong. They, they, it's like, well, oh, I don't need those. But what we find is that most of the time, the people will run with just their hands here, and it's kind of like this, or they stay in the same place, or they have their iPhone in their hand, or a cup of coffee, or a bottle of water, whatever, and they, they don't use their arms at all. And yet, they're very important for you to keep uh, balance. They're important for you to get that drive up with your leg. They're important for you that you're using it as your drive back when you're using your glutes. So it's very important to use. Now, if you did it like a sprinter, you'd be exhausted by the time you got to your first mile if you're running many miles. So Alberto has come up with, and what he does, he calls it hips to nips. Your hands should be running from your hip to nipple, and it should be nice and rhythmic, all from the shoulder, about 90 degrees or less, and you keep that motion going, and it keeps you from rotating, because most of the people I see will start doing this. And if you cross your midline at all, you're in a lot of trouble. But secondly, you're using energy for going this way and that, and you're trying to go that way. So it's like a washing machine for your motor, and it's not the direction you want to go. So we find that uh, that is also a thing that will start your hips rotating, knees rotating, on down your Achilles. And again, with research showing what happens with stress fractures and you're doing the pounding, you're pounding and now adding a twist, it's way too much for the bone. So here's an example. This is um, Galen Rupp. Galen Rupp is the guy I was talking about. The, he's the 10 time 10,000 meter. Um, oh, wrong way. Where is the. Uh, here it is. Okay. Watch Galen run. Uh, and I'll get this right, Art. Bring this up. It's like smart water. It's, you know, like you got a dumb guy doing it. It doesn't matter what you're doing. What am I clicking? There you go. Thank you, right hand man. So you'll see his hands basically running from his nips to hip. We all should be able to run that smooth, too, right? He's running like a 530 pace. So again, that's a simple, easy method to start doing and again you can practice without even moving right so uh, a simple thing to get them doing again it'll stop some of that the next is stride length and more research is out there on stride length than anything else um, that you should be landing close to your center of gravity some people say at the center of gravity you really can't move if you're doing that because you're running in place so it has to be a little bit in front but there's research out there that shows that if your stride length decreases the stress fractures decrease, okay, which is an important part. If your stride length increases, your energy increases. To do, and it's more painful besides. So the thing that you want to remember that when I'm doing a, a long stride out in front of me, you're also probably doing a couple other things, and they all are interrelated, and you fix one, you'll probably fix them all. You're probably landing on your heel, and you're probably landing with more of a straight leg. All of these things cause more force rapidly up through the tib and femur. And this is, again, one of the things that they show causes more stress fracture, the rapid uh, uh, increase of speed uh, when you're doing it. So we want to think of our stride length and keep that a little bit shorter. Now, this is one that I never thought of. It's trail step width. I had to come up with trail because I needed a T. Um, so this is how wide your feet are apart. Never thought about that at all. The wider your feet are, the better balance you have. The closer your feet are, the more power and energy you can have going forward. And so what I try to, to get people to do is if you're running down the highway, hopefully on the shoulder, um, unless you're uh, Tiger Woods and you're all over the place, uh, that 
you want to have both feet be able to touch that white line. If you watch Galen Rupp or any of the world-class runners run, their feet are absolutely in front of each other like you're doing a drunk test. And it sounds difficult because, you know, some people, but you're running and both feet are in the air and it's not that difficult. Um, there are things in research that show that there may be more IT, IT band problems and anterior tip problems and stress fractures if you do it. But I find working with patients that it, that is true if you're overstriding and trying to do this. If you're not overstriding, then you don't put those stresses on there as much. Now let's see if I can do better with this one, Eric. 1A, find it. There you go. There we go. And you look and see how his feet are right smack in front of him. This is Galen Rupp again. And this was, I filmed this and it's like I was just fascinated. I had never seen it before. Started looking at myself running down the beach where you can get a nice mark of where you're doing. And lo and behold, I was doing it already. So I guess that's maybe why I was doing well in my age groups, that I was uh, not worrying about balance too much, which you need to do when you get older, uh, and still working on the speed. E is explode. I use that as how you're going to land and how you push off. And this is where we talk about forefoot and midfoot running. And more research is out there now because of the barefoot running craze uh, that they started doing a lot of research. Uh, if you want to look up, Irene Davis has done most of this research, some fascinating, great work that she's done. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Kukuzela, is one of, his, uh, one of her patients that has done a lot of this stuff. But we find if you land more on your midfoot or forefoot, that automatically decreases the length of your stride, which we've already talked about. Um, it's more economical in that you're absorbing shock with those bones and muscles in your feet that you're bypassing if you're landing on your heels and driving at calcaneus to uh, tibia. You have less contact time on the ground, which any track person will tell you that's what speed is. The faster you're off, on and off the ground, the faster you will be, and you'll get more power and explosion off of it. Um, Jay Dichier in his talks talks about 85% of your force should come off of your big toe. And that's one of the things I emphasize with the people is that I want you to think more of what happens behind you than in front of you. You want to get that foot down and fast and you're more forefoot, but let it come back here and get that drive off so that you're using your glute and driving off your big toe. So I talk about even having you have a giant claw on your big toe and you're trying to dig in and push with that and it's really helped guys get the power that they need uh, when they uh, are running. And the last, the letter R is the RPM. What's your turnover rate? And it was talked about in, uh, earlier is that uh, Alberto feels and the research looks at it, should be about 180 uh, RPM or 90 per each leg which is easier to count. I, it's tough to get that many. Uh, and I train my people by doing uh, a couple things and get them used to doing them and then get on a treadmill so that they understand what that uh, ratio is. There are all kinds of met metronomes you can get apps for that will play an audio that and do it. But again, uh, your Fitbit or all those things will, will show those and you can practice it. A skateboard gets you so that your foot is in that proper position. Uh, if you can get them on a skateboard or a razor and have them go through that they're just touching with that four foot and getting the RPM. Uh, we have a curve trainer treadmill that is kind of self-powered. Uh, we use that for right leg and left leg and so all those things will help do it. And again, if you increase your RPM, uh, you have less impact. You have a decreased stride length because you can't turn over fast enough if you're over striding. And again, it forces you into more of a midfoot landing. So again, here's uh, round number three. This is showing, uh, again, Galen uh, doing, and you can look at his foot, how it's <coughs> landing midfoot, forefoot, and pushing off. An important part of that, and again, in the teaching moment, is that um, I try to get them so that when I look at um, the film from the side, that they don't have their foot pulled back. Most people will, if they're heel runners, are going to have their foot like this, and you look at a film, you'll see that their foot is way back like that. Get them to relax that foot, relax the anterior tibs so they don't have all that work that they talked about problems, and try to get it at least neutral so they're, they're coming in that way. And actually, when you looked at high-speed films of um, him running, he, if uh, it's 
colors for the pressure that they have, like heat sensitive. Well, the pressures are a light blue and a pretty green and a yellow and an orange and a red. And he has a tiny little dot on his heel of light blue. And then you see going from fifth to first, yellow, orange, and then red and orange on the first and second metatarsal. And the last thing you see is his big toe pushing off on, the, on that. So that's what you're looking for. That's what you're trying to do. I use a, an app that um, uh, they, they showed me. It used to be called uh, Uber, and it got confused with uh, getting a taxi all the time. So instead, it's now called Huddle Technique, H-U-D-L, and it's a slow motion film that you can do full speed, half speed, quarter speed, and use stop action using your finger drying. But you can even use your iPhone and do it in slow motion and, and film somebody from the side. And you can help them if you have a treadmill or even running by you and then sit down with them. And I use that paper using faster and go on each one of those and say, all right, let's see what you do on each of these points. So I sit down and talk to each of the guys and go over that. Uh, and here's the results. Um, in the last two and a half, three years, we have had 104 stress fractures, which is probably as many as I've seen in my career in track all the time because all the great things that we have to do. It's also hard to run with this boat on your head, too. Uh, that kind of weighs things down. Um, but of those, I've only had um, three repeat stress fractures out of 104 guys that we've changed. And as I said, 71% of them were guys who had lousy running technique, and we just changed that. And also it says all, four, all people pass the four-mile run. So every week they have to do a four-mile run uh, on the beach, and uh, they have to pass it. If they don't pass it, they're out. So they've increased their speed. Uh, one ice hockey player increased his speed by four minutes in his four-mile run. And um, again, had, was a bilateral stress fracture guy. Uh, so of the, of the guys I've had through there, 67% have now graduated. So again, the graduation rate of a class is 25%. So we have some motivated people that do some good things with it, OK? Um, I won't go through uh, like the protocol too much. It's all the things we talked about. We do crutches, the upper body exercise, or exercise bike. Again, I work at 90, 100, 105 RPM to try to get them used to turning over, uh, do interval sprints and hills and things to try to, to get them back in their conditioning. We have a G trainer, so we'll start people at 50% their body weight, and each week it'll go 60, 70, 80, and then I start them on the treadmill. When I get them on the treadmill, the first thing I do is I film them, uh, five, six, seven, eight mile an hour. I film them at eight mile an hour, and uh, then again, I break that down. And after we've gone over the teaching techniques, each time we will try to go uh, a little bit longer on the treadmill, so they're doing 20 minutes or more until I finally have them out running. Um, so this was just an example of a guy uh, who was uh, running. This was actually the ice hockey player. Not a good view of his legs. Uh, he looks kind of squatty in this position, but I'll just show you. This is the problem we had. You can see um, bow legs didn't help. Um, arms carried a little bit wide. Again, when you see the elbows out, that's going to start you rotating across, so you want to try to get those in. I try to tell them you want to Velcro those across. So those are the things that we're trying to, to get across and do with the guys. Uh, it's important to evaluate as they talk about, but for the things that we can do to help them, again, a lot of times if you're in a college situation, once you've got the limp out of them, you send them to a strength coach who in many cases doesn't have a running background, and they're not going to do it. The track coach says, oh, you know, this is the way he runs, but you have them as somebody coming back just like an ACL or something like that, you can get them running. And again, it doesn't have to be stress fractures. It can be any injury that you want to get them running again. You want to make sure that they're running efficiently so that they can do well in their sport, and you want to make sure that they're not going to get hurt. And again, there's some simple things you can do that will help that. So you can change their style. You can decrease their injuries. Um, the efficiency may, may increase their speed because there are guys who are out there fast that I know running in master's track that have beaten me, and you look at them, it's like, how the heck did he beat me? Or now in road races, I see you know, some people who aren't in real great shape that are still ahead of me. It's like, you know, it'll still vary with VO2 max and all the other things. But 
more efficiency makes it easier for you in the long run. And again, my running has become much easier with less pain at 70 years old uh, than it has been for many, many years. Uh, it's an effective tool to make changes. And also, the faster part, what we found more than anything, and these are guys who have even gone on to SEAL Team 6, use it now as a tool when they start to get fatigued, they can focus on thinking of what their technique is. Because if you've ever seen somebody um, in, a, in the 400 meters, at 300 meters, they all fall apart. Whether it's they are carrying a refrigerator, the bear jumped on their back, whatever you want to call it, they start to fall apart. And the guys who do well still have good technique. And that's no matter what distance you're doing, that last quarter of it, if you keep a good technique, things will go well. My last thought is, is uh, one of the old SEALs I work with, um, uh, I call him Tattoo Mike is um, um, had been in Vietnam and he said an important teaching point was stupidity should be painful, he said. That way you learn quickly and don't do it again. So that's the way with the stress fractures again. It's painful. Hopefully they will learn the things to try to make them better. It may take a couple weeks to a couple months to get the technique right, but it is possible and has great um, effects.